Hello everyone, so welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. So we are back with some more comparative history, comparative warfare and comparative war equipment. So yesterday we talked about the Gladius and the Katana. Today we're going to compare the Samurai Armor versus the Lorica Segmentata. Now, of course, when you say um, Lorica Segmentata, I have simply chosen one out of many possible different kinds of uh, Roman armor. So why did I choose that one specifically and why are we using a 16th century uh, Tose Gusoku uh, set of armor for our comparison? Well, and of course, I, in order to do this video, to make this video rather uh, shortish, I had to choose um, to, to choose one armor to represent the samurai and one armor to represent the Romans. Um, of course, we could um, basically compare each single set of armor that these uh, civilizations have used throughout their entire history, but that would make for a very, very long video. I'm talking about an hour-ish, which we could do eventually, but today we're just, just going to keep it short so that I can also see how well this idea goes and how well this series goes before actually committing more resources and time into the production of a longer video. Um, I chose these two specifically. Well, of course, I chose the Lorica Segmentata or Lorica Laminata for the Romans because it is the most iconic armor when anyone thinks of the Romans. Although we do have to say, as I say, as I said many times on my videos, that the typical and the sort of armor that the Romans used for a longer amount of time would be the Lorica Hamata, so the male armor. That is the that should be the most icon iconic armor for the Romans, but it's so happens that of course I own a Ludica Segmentata because it is my favorite uh, way of version of armor and the fact that I own it means that I can give better um, information about it because I have worn it and that is also the reason why I've chosen the 16th century Tose Gusoku for the um, for the Japanese because I own it I own one it's a fantastic replica very well made by iron mounted armory and uh, um, I have worn it I have experience so it's not just pure academical uh, knowledge but it is actually a sort of reenactment knowledge if you will so I have run in armor I have uh, marched in both armors I have fought in these armors I have horseback uh, ridden in at least in samurai armor although I, I will I still have to um, make some footage of it which I will which I will for the Lurica Segmentata, I haven't uh, war, I haven't horseback ridden, although I will, and I will tell you why. I think that could be justifiable. But um, so my choice of armors, my choice of these two sets of armor, mostly is because, of course, I own them, so I can show you these armors. But but that's not really the reason, because I could still put up pictures on the on the on the screen and show you Lurica Hamata versus 11th century uh, Yoroi, for example. But uh, it's mostly because I've worn them, and so I have direct, real experience of these sets of armor, and I can talk about pros and cons not only through whatever you can read on books, but actually through personal, first-hand experience. So, of course, these sets of armor belong to completely different and separate uh, times. Um, the Tose Gusoku is a 16th century armor, whereas the Lorica Segmentata is an imperial armor, so we're talking about 100 AD. Um, but, of course, when you compare Roman things with anything else, like which is more modern or which goes into feudal times and medieval times, there will be a huge technological gap. Okay, so to begin with, I'd like to first wear the uh, my samurai armor and talk about it, and I will get changed to wear my uh, Roman armor and talk about it and then I'll draw my conclusions on to which of these two uh, uh, sets of armor, or these two armors, I'm not sure whether I can pluralize this word, so I'll just not pluralize it for now, of these two sets of armor I would actually choose if I had to go to a, a duel and to a battle in reality. So, starting with Samurai Ama, this is a, as I said, Tose Gusoku, 16th century Takeda clan officers level Samurai Ama, and, or Gasira level. Um, basically, I'd like to begin from the very bottom, so we will start from footwear, we'll go all the way to the top and the helmet. Well, footwear is probably one of the weakest points of samurai armor, although there are quite a lot of possible options. So, um, normally we see uh, samurai wearing these, basically called, uh, they, they are straw sandals. They are called waraji, uh, sometimes even called zori. 
uh, of course, no protection whatsoever. I have to say, uh, not particularly comfortable. In fact, when, when you wear them, your toes should stick out. And that's problematic because if, if, when you walk on a nice grassland, it's not a problem. But when you walk in a rocky mountain, as I, as I did, it can be really dangerous because you can hit your toes or, and it can hurt a lot. So I, I, I can't even imagine fighting and running around these. Um, sometimes you see me wear the getta, but the getta were not used in, in battle. Okay, never. Um, so did the samurai wear getta? Some did, and we do have some iconog iconography proving that some, some samurai did wear these, uh, not in armor though. Uh, so when I wear them, uh, I wear them because yes, some samurai did, but it's just because I like them, to be honest, because uh, wearing the getta, uh, the getta are not particularly comfortable, although I prefer wearing the getta than, prefer, than, than wearing these. I prefer these wooden clogs. Um, however, so some samurai did, and we, and we know that, but it wasn't very common. In fact, there are uh, descriptions of other samurai from other clan making fun of the samurai were wearing these. So these would be much more common and apparently some samurai would have a spare set of uh, wareji just on their belt just in case or you know during campaign if the set that they were wearing was completely worn off or torn out uh, they would uh, basically make some new ones just using as I said some straw. So of course a samurai wearing this sort of footwear has absolutely no protection on his feet but there are other possibilities which I will soon acquire um, which are basically boots or leather boots or sometimes with fur sometimes without and those I think would be a much better catch in combat. Also there is the possibility to wear um, armoured tabi which basically tabi, tabi are the socks so armoured socks with mail on top of them and then you also have other forms of, of footwear so the fact that I don't own it doesn't mean that it didn't exist okay the samurai did protect their feet um, I would imagine and those who were just wearing waraji is, is those who probably couldn't afford better protection and here we are in Roman armor Funny enough, the footwear her is really good. Um, this is a kaligae, so basically uh, military boots, uh, open, as you can see, used by the uh, Roman soldiers for at least a certain period of time. Not all the time, but this is very, very commonly uh, depicted, and most people, when they think of military footwear of the Romans, they do think of these, so basically leather uh, boots with studded um, metal studs iron studs for reinforcement okay and also helps you with the grip to the soil now if you walk with these on um, uh, soil if you walk with these in uh, in the woods in the in, in a grove in, uh, in on top of mountains these are very good on the grassland anywhere any sort of terrain is really good but if you walk with these on a nice paved floor you know one of those floors that you get for example in schools sometimes in our day and age um oh my goodness he's gonna be hilarious like you're gonna be like skiing basically you can ski with these so that's a, that's a bit problematic but that, you know of course roman soldiers wouldn't have been wa were walking on those and perhaps the only ones the only sort of romans that would have walked in very lustrous palaces with that sort of flooring um, would have been the Praetorian Guards and I imagine that they didn't use these anyways because otherwise it would have been just hilarious. <laughs> Anyhow, excellent form of protection for the feet. Um, not, not, not in battle, it's not going to protect you from uh, salt cuts but it's perfect for the weather. It's water. It's almost waterproof because it drains very quickly because of the fact that it's open as you can see. Um, so to be honest I think I would wear Roman footwear a million times over Japanese uh, footwear of all the kinds I've tried so far. So I have to say that I, I do need to give a big plus to the Romans for these. These are one of the most comfortable, some of the most comfortable shoes I've ever worn in my life and even compared to modern shoes, believe it or not, these are just fantastic. Of course, in terms of protection, if you compare them to some of the heaviest uh, versions of armoured, um, for example, uh, footwear of the Japanese, then the Japanese would have more protection, of course, but still, I think these are fantastic, particularly for marching and walking for, for long distances, which is precisely what Roman infantry had to do.
stepping up, we now move to the Suneate. The Suneate is the, basically the Shin Guard, the Greaves. Now, these are always, universally in Japan, they are always demi-greaves. So there is no protection to the back, no protection to the calf, okay? Only protection to the shin, um, differently from Europe, because we, we will eventually, at first we also use demi-greaves, but then we will eventually move on to um, all-round uh, greaves protecting the entire uh, leg. The Japanese never will do that, and they will always re rely on the protection of the front of their legs. Um, these are very, very comfortable. I, I, it happened to me that I wore them um, for basically half a day and I forgot that I had them on and then until like my, my uh, cousin actually told me why, why are you wearing, wearing those for? And I'm like, oh, I forgot to take them off. So these are incredibly comfortable. Um, and as you can see, they have got, now my version is a little bit of a posher version, so, so to speak, because they have got this um, silk in them. This is called a kyahang and normally they are sold separately. So they are separate but in my case it's sewn onto the greave. So this is a little higher quality. Also the as you can see that this um, part here makes it for protection from down down uh, upward coming blows. So this is a uh, suneate for cavalry, so mounted samurai, but not all samurai were mounted. Some samurai were on foot, and samurai who were on foot would wear this sort of suneate rather than these. Also because with these it's very, it's be much better protection of course for your for your leg considering attacks coming from from below but um, it's basically impossible to kneel with these it's incredibly painful I've tried of course and so um, someone who would just walk uh, they would wear the other version so overall I would say that a Suneata is a very interesting piece of kit it's comfortable it's protective and I would say it's definitely a plus for the samurai armor. Now, Roman legionaries did not, as far as we know, have any protection as far as the shin or the lower part of the legs is concerned. No shin guards, no greaves. Is that because the Romans didn't have the technology to do it? Absolutely, they did. In fact, Roman uh, gladiators did use that. Sometimes they only used one on the left side because of the fact that when you fight, normally, particularly when you're using a shield, you will have your shield in front because that's your line of defense. And so you will have your left leg in front okay so that's why they only used a grief leg it was rather difficult to reach the other um, shin or the other leg leg which is in the back but so they could make some and they even had some padding inside it not for Roman legionaries why because the legionaries had to march for miles and miles imagine walking from Rome to France, modern day France, having pieces of metal on your legs. No, they didn't. And of course, they could have just uh, brought them, carried them perhaps, and, and then just wear them before the battle. But still, on the battle, the Roman army, the Roman unit wanted to be as movable uh, as possible. And also, they were already carrying it a lot of stuff. So carrying an extra three kilos of, of metal protection would have been rather problematic, not to mention the money for, for having to produce all this uh, protection for the legs. And again, the Roman scutum would protect your legs anyways, so there was no point, and the Romans were not wearing shin guards. The samurai did protect the lower body very well, so this, this is called haidate. So it's the protection for the thighs. You basically wear it as an apron, sort of, uh, slightly above your navel, and it goes there to protect your thighs. It's basically lots of different metal plates or metal scales which interlocked and overlap with each other. Now, um, very smart and very intelligent idea because it does leave you very free to walk and apparently it's fastened in the front so that if it does happen that it's becoming un encumbering or that perhaps you need to cross a uh, cross water or fight on boats and you don't want this to impede your movement as much then you can actually remove it very easily. But again, um, all the times I've worn it Never, it never really was a problem. What is important though is that you need to fasten it properly because if you don't and then it becomes a problem because it, it just goes down on top of your knee and it's difficult to, to put back in position with the rest of your armor on. So this is something that I've learned myself uh, through wearing the armor. You need to tighten this properly otherwise it might be a problem. Apart from that, good protection for the thigh. The Romans did have a belt which is a military belt, it's called um, Kingulum. Now, as far as protection is, now mine is a little bit cheap on the cheap side. In fact, I'm going to buy a better one, a higher quality one soon. 
thanks to my Patreon again. Thank you so much, guys, for your support. Because thanks for the, to the Patreon donation, I've decided to uh, use some of that to improve my Roman set. So we'll have a better quality Kingulum. Also, because the Kingulum was a very important aspect and part and component of, of uh, Roman armor, because it was the only part of the armor you would wear when you would when you would be in town, for example, or when you would be. Uh, on the camp. It's something you would keep on your tunic uh, even after removing the armor because it would just show that you are a soldier rather than a civilian. So um, important uh, element also because as far as protection is concerned this one does not grant any protection okay nothing. If someone tries to stab you in the groin and you've got this it's not gonna block anything okay. So um, no it's not for protection but it has other function. Function number one when you wear it it will depending on how you wear it but it will keep your gladius in place and this is important because you have to remember that the gladius goes on the right side because on the left as far as legionaries are concerned centurions would wear it on the left side but legionaries would wear it on the right side because on the left side they are wielding the scutum information and so it would be rather difficult to draw your sword from the left if you've got the scutum you would have to open okay and if there is missile fire you don't want that to happen so what the romans had to do they had to draw it like this okay but as you can see in order to draw it properly i need to hold the scabbard down with my hands in order for it to be able to draw the, the gladius. Well this is what the kingulum is doing for me considering that my left hand is rather busy. The kingulum is gonna hold the, uh, the um, scabbard of the gladius in place so that when I draw it uh, I'm not basically uh, taking, it's not sticking to the gladius and, uh, and, uh, and it's gonna be easier for me to draw my weapon when the centurions or the centurionis will give the command. Also, the uh, Kingdom supposedly has the uh, another function, which is that of tightening the armor up. In fact, when you wear it, you need to wear it very tight. When you do that, the part of the weight of the armor again will be uh, on your hips. Now, it's easier to do that with a Lorica Hamata with any kind of mail than it is with a Segmentata because of the fact that it's solid. However, if you see, even if I use my hands, I can tighten it up a little okay so basically this is what it's, so it's not going to do make a huge difference but it will make a little bit of a difference if it's very very tight but again in my opinion i've tried both not as much as it would with male now another important thing to say about samurai armor is that the torse gusoku is rather light it's solid okay it's solid metal it's plate armor but still it, the way it's organized okay the as you can see the armor cuts just at my hips just a little bit above my hips it doesn't go all the way down and what this means in fact i've got my obi here covering okay and also it's where i will put my my weapons my katana my uh, wakizashi etc and the tanto now um this makes it so and also the fact that it's tailored on for my body makes it so that all the weight is at the waist on my hips rather than on my shoulders and this makes it for a much more comfortable wear the armor is fully enclosing me i'm completely covered the only uh, little problem is the right side here i didn't actually even bother <laughs> Uh, closing it I could have done so it can be closed but it doesn't it, it never really close completely even if you're really good and you need some help here to close it properly but it never really completely closes at least this version of Samurai Yama so this could be a little bit of a weak spot but considering a guard position you see my my arm already goes here to cover so depending on how I strike it could happen that I open myself up but it's still not an easy target it's still a small moving target and I think I, I would say it's rather difficult to get through here but it's definitely a weak point or a weak po spot in Samurai Yama so moving forward the uh, Ele the most important element of course is the cuirass and as you can see it's very solid it's basically cut proof uh, everywhere and it's very difficult to pierce it as well because all the segments overlap so most of the times you have two layers of metal you have to deal with and when you move to the shoulders the, this concept is actually brought to the next level because you've got several like sometimes even as much as three plates to go through if you really want to hack the you know the the legionary with a sword or with an axe so it's rather difficult to get through this and the reason why the shoulder plate are the heavily heaviest the most heavily armored area is because the legionary um, is most of the time using the scutum up to here so this is the only area that is rather exposed and 
this is why this is heavily protected. So as far as the shoulder plates are concerned, Roman armor gives much better protection than samurai armor. And also, as you can see, I have no gap here. There is always a gap in the, under the armpit. But in samurai armor, we could appreciate that this part is also open because they have to operate a bow. Uh, whereas Romans, no. So Roman legionaries are basically heavy infantry, so this all part is protected. All they may basically have to do is either this or this in some uh, situations, most of the time thrusting, of course. The arms are rather lightly armoured. They are still pretty good, but of course my hands are free, but you can have uh, gloves to protect yourself. So this was my personal choice. I still haven't acquired them. Um, I could do, so you can uh, buy armoured gloves, which will protect this part, but of course it will make it a little bit harder to feel your weapon. So in this way, it's easier to fight. Also, um, the plates offer some reasonable protection for your arms, um, although in the back of my arms you can see there is only fabric, so there is absolutely virtually no protection, just a little bit, well it's not that easy to cut through fabric anyways, but if you got a very, if you place a very good uh, thrust here it would penetrate. However, again you can reinforce your um, underarm and you can um, wear extra protection to sort of um, and, and that's the same for this part here, which is again a part where there is no armor. But, of course, the more stuff you wear, the bulkier you will be. This is the standard armor that I would say most samurai would have worn in the 16th century. So the real weak point of samurai armor is, of course, the armpit, because the armpit cannot be armored, otherwise you will impede mobility. And I need mobility because I need to... Well, in earlier times I needed to be able to operate a bow, which you can see I perfectly can, but in modern times I would have to be able to operate a Tanegashima Teppo most of the time. So again, I need this sort of mobility. And since I own one, why not showing it? So that's the sort of mobility I need. And of course, you can't armor my armpits if I need to be able to do this. The pauldrons, the sode, are here to protect me from arrows mostly, but of course uh, also from other kinds of weapons uh, that might attack me. Um, they are secured and fastened at the back through the red lace, which will sort of keep them in place. I have seen some demonstrations of people doing samurai combat actually where the sword sort of goes the other way around but that's because they didn't um, secure them uh, properly. If you do that properly it shouldn't happen as you can see regardless of how I move the sword go back into place. They leave this part open as you can see. Um, so it's not really the best. <laughs> Sometimes I've seen some armor, some sets of armor where the sword are worn differently, more towards the front. But this, I would say, is the most typical way of wearing them. So, as far as the actual protection that the armor, that the cuirass gives, I would say the Roman armor makes me feel more protected. However, the arms are completely exposed. Now, there has been some interesting discussion among scholars about this, and some say that perhaps the Romans did wear some sort of wrapping around the hands in order not to get, for example, for when you pick uh, the scutum perhaps on the left hand, and maybe some little bit of protection here, but still it was not going to be metal, and all the rest of the forearms um, as far as we know any anyways if we look at any sort of iconography for example the Trajan column all we see is legionaries with completely bare uh, arms and nothing on their hands no protection so if we have to consider that which is most likely what how things were um, then yes the arms are not protected again the left arm is on a problem it's protected by the scutum but this arm needs to go out to attack and this could become a target and it would be so this does not make me feel much protected in, in fact when um, during the Dacian Wars the Romans did wear the manica so full protection for the right arm only and yes I would have to wear that if I I would definitely wear that if I were to go to battle um, because I, I, I would rather feel that otherwise I would feel that this arm is too um, unprotected as far as I'm concerned Moving on to the helmet now. Yes, we know that there is this possibility of using the mempo. Just let me show you very quickly how this works. So I wear my helmet, my kabuto. I would have to tie my hair up in a better way so that it doesn't come towards my front. But yeah, I could do a chombage. My hair is long enough. Anyways, um, so this is the kabuto. Now, yes, there is a mempo. And I'd like to show you how the helmet looks. 
with a mempool, but you need to take into consideration that most likely mempool were not used in combat. Now, I've been having this conversation, doing a little bit of research with my friend Anthony Cummings on this, and we looked, we looked for a lot of different um, uh, iconography of the time, and every time the samurai shown into battle, they never wear the mempool. And you could even find a... There we go. So here it is. One, two, and three. So this is the mempo. But as I said, no iconography which shows samurai wearing this into battle. And he even found some uh, passages in a, one of the scrolls that he's translating which talks, and actually uh, talks about the mempo and says, do not wear it for battle. So it's like most likely that we still don't have 100% um, we're still not 100% sure about this, but most likely the mempo was removed, omitted in combat. The reason that I could think of is, first of all, mempo only has a psychological aspect. As far as protection is concerned, well, um, yes, it is a plate of metal on top of your face, but if you get hit properly um, with a weapon, particularly if it's blunt force, it's still going to smash your jaw. If it's some light cutting, it would protect you, but the real so it does offer a certain degree of protection. But I think the most the main problem here is ventilation. In fact, it's it's even difficult to talk now. I mean, I can talk, but if I really had to fasten this properly, my mouth shouldn't be able to move. So you could also you could only. Um, breathe through your nose and that could be problematic in combat so I would say of course some people removed the nose you can do that let me show you yeah, you see so now I have a bit more ventilation I can breathe more easily sorry there we go now I can breathe more easily without the nose definitely ah, but um, you know, some people did this, some people did this, other people only did a little protection here, but most people, I would say, would not wear one, so we're not going to wear it for now. Okay, sorry for the noise of the armor, but samurai armor can be very noisy. Here's another thing that we can learn. Samurai armor can be very, if you move, you see, it makes a lot of noise. Anyway, so um, this was normally fastened. There are many ways to fasten this, uh, like going all over your chin, going all the way back. But interestingly enough, the Kabuto is an excellent for a form of protection. It's thick, it's strong, and it protects me very well from the side, protects my neck. It's an excellent piece of gear. So I would say that this is, together with the door, this one here, the most robust part and best part of the Samurai Tose Gusoku. Here I've got a imperial helmet and there are many different kinds but this is an imperial helmet uh, type h it's a little broken because i fight in armor so uh, yeah so uh, I, I have to fix this but the idea is um this is the helmet and i'm gonna wear it now now most of the times um all the times these cheek plates will be tightened like this okay so you would wear the little cord broke so i need to replace it but um, you would basically wear it like this okay so it's going to protect completely your head this way okay now um so of course my face is expo is exposed uh, and that's because the romans mostly wanted to have to breathe properly and to have complete vision and also i need to be able to understand the commands of my centurions this is why you've got these ear holes here on the side and in fact i have to say that um in both cases samurai helmet and roman helmet i can hear quite well and vision is good now of course you could debate that on, with the samurai uh, armor you can wear the mask and have better protection for the face but as we could appreciate most samurai didn't so I I would say that they are both open in the face area. So a Roman helmet is an excellent form of protection. Also, you've got the back plate here, which is going to offer protection not only to the back of your neck, but also you have to imagine that when you, if you receive a strike to you, towards your face, what's the first instinctive reaction you will have? Is to do this, okay? When you do that, the plate is going to cover up and give an extra layer of protection for your shoulder. Very ingenious. So overall, which armor would I be wearing into battle? Well, I have to say that it would really depend on what I'm going to do and who I'm going to fight and where I'm going to fight. Because um, Roman armor offers better protection to the torso. And if, he, if, it's, if it's used in combination with a scutum and a gladius, I would definitely go for that one. But 
Now, if I had to think of protection alone, then uh, Roman armor has to be used in combination with a scutum, because otherwise it's too open. If it's just Roman armor and I don't have access to a scutum, I'm definitely going to, to use samurai armor, no doubt, no questions asked. But if I am uh, using a scutum and a gladius, so if I'm using the complete set, then actually Roman armor is quite good, but it does have a problem. You have to consider that samurai armor is technologically superior, particularly the Tose Gusoku. So Tose Gusoku is more co comfortable to wear, so if I had to wear the armor for an extended amount of time, then I would immediately go for samurai armor. It's just, just so much more comfortable to wear. This one weighs on your shoulders, even if you wear, of course, if you wear super malice, uh, you will have padding, so it's not as bad. But still, samurai armor is a lot lighter, the, the weight distribution is much better, and um, it does give me a lot more free freedom of movement. So, um, ultimately, although I am in love with Lorica Segmentata, if I had to use armor for an extended amount of time, or if part of the fighting I was involved with, with was single fighting rather than unit fighting, then I would definitely go for samurai armor. So, out of the two, although I am uh, strongly attached to the Roman armor because I'm Italian and Italian's fanboy over Rome, I will have to say that in, there are many occasions in which I would go for for samurai armor and I would pick Roman armor only in very specific situations and scenarios. All right, number one, so I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. I will, I will soon release more linguistic content. There is some gaming videos going, going up because I will be talking about more, more, Dao, more Dao, I don't know how to pronounce it, but more Dao, I don't know, but I will be talking about that game and other interesting games which feature uh, medieval combat. Um, I will continue my uh, literary series and cultural series about the Japanese yokai and possibly I will go on talking about other uh, myths from, for example, European and other cultures in the world. So I will not only focus on Japanese folklore, but we will expand um, to, uh, into the world's folklore, if you will. I thank you for your time, I really appreciate you watching my content, I'll see you tomorrow for my next daily video, and remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye.